Okay, hopefully that sound will be all right. What's up and welcome to Zwift Power Up Cycling Podcast. I am Rasan Bahadi. And for the month of February, which is Black History Month, but also the best months of all months because it's also my birthday month, I'll be bringing you some really special interviews to Mark Zwift's Black Celebration Series. Now, Zwift, we're committed to making a more inclusive space in the cycling industry for people of color and encouraging conversations. So. For this month, we'll be re-releasing an interview with Justin Williams, as well as bringing you fresh interviews from prominent black athletes and community leaders who are doing what we need to do and fight a good fight. So without further ado, let's get into this week's interview. Hey, what's up? It's Rasan, and I'm here with someone that I've personally known for a very long time. And uh, it's interesting that our relationship uh, has gone pretty much full circle. Myself. I started off as a snotty nosed kid uh, racing bikes throughout uh, Southern California. This gentleman uh, took it amongst himself along with a organization within LA um, and other individuals to make sure not only myself, but others continue to race. So I am uh, excited to bring to the podcast, Mr. Damon Turner. Damon, how you doing? I'm great, man. I'm great. And I am like, surprised that you are the interviewer uh, <laughs> but I'm excited to be here man and as you said this is this has come full circle I mean to where we are are still involved in the sport at this level and so um so before you get too deep into that yes right I know you let's let the listeners know who you just give give uh, give us a brief introduction. Yeah, I have got so also my saddle. It is going. So up. I so started be going. Um, Unity Sports, which is part of our youth development cycling team, back in 2007, and it was sort of off of what I had already been doing with with uh, you and other other juniors in Southern California, and so that started out as a nonprofit organization. It was actually only two uh, uh, two boys involved with that team. And so as we grew, uh, I became the founder of, uh, of Unity Sports, and now we're LA Bike Academy, and uh, we're a youth development cycling team, and we're trying to expand into other parts of uh, bike retail as far as developing skill sets with, with, with young people in, um, in the bicycle business. So this is a common question amongst black people in the cycling space um, because for so long, even dating back to when we met, I didn't even think about even to ask you back then, which was well more than 20 years ago. 
you know, how did a how did a, a black guy get into cycling in the city of LA? What was your introduction? Wow, that's a that's a great question. And this is a true story. I was sitting on my balcony in, I don't know, it might've been 91 having coffee. And by the way, but at that time, I was a full-time surfer. I was not cycling at all. I was surfing every day, man. And I saw what was then, or obviously now major motion go by the, the, the club out of Los Angeles, major motion cycling club. It was a group of 20 or so black cyclists. And I had never seen that in my life. I had called my wife to the to the balcony, like, look at what look. Like, I was shocked. And that was my introduction. It was like when I saw that, it was like, that's something I want to do. And so that was that was how I got into the sport. Why do you think that's a very uh I think common story amongst our community? Why do you think we're so surprised and shocked when we see people like us on bikes? <laughs> Well, it's been a lack of exposure, you know. I think if you look historically, like even the book about black champions that came out, a lot of people weren't aware of all that information that existed. And um, it just, it, the, the information has never been out there or at least had not been out there at that time. Mm -hmm. And so, and then of course, there's the there's the, uh, the roadblocks, you know, economically, uh, the uh, the cost of the sport so yeah i think those are some of the things yeah because even today you know like i say you're talking almost 30 years later i think there's still that uh shock of wait black people ride bikes um i had a conversation with a guy yesterday uh about formula one and it was the same thing he had no idea who lewis hamilton was and i was scratching my head because i like i follow the sport of formula one but i guess if you're not exposed to it and you don't follow it you would never know that there was a brother out there kicking butt and taking names you know um so you talked about surfing uh i didn't even know that w what what else did you do leading up to uh the switch to cycling uh if you don't mind sharing what, what, what else were you into? What was your occupation? You know, I know you, you grew up, I mean, you grew up, you had, you raised two, uh, two young boys and married. And what else did you do in your day, your daily life? So I actually started out riding BMX locally in the community right here, Lamert Park, Baldwin Hills, uh, was involved in skateboarding heavily. As you know, I ran a skateboard shop for two and a half years and mm -hmm. that was uh, community based, but yeah. A lot of the non-traditional sports I literally did. Like I would be, I would catch the bus with a surfboard on uh, Pico Boulevard going west of the beach and people would be looking at me like I was a Martian, you know. Slippers on, hair about as long as yours at that particular time. And I was on a mission to be different. So yes, yeah, skateboarding, BMX, uh, you know, motocross, in fact, you know, quite a bit. And so, yeah, I was just, when I saw cycling, that was, uh, that was my cue. And by the way, I was uh, a bicycle messenger for two and a half years in downtown Los Angeles. I was delivering legal documents on a bike and I didn't even know you could get paid to do that. And at that particular time, you know, it was like, you can get paid to ride a bike, to deliver legal documents. So I'm zipping in and out of law firms, you know, delivering legal documents on a bike and then got hired for the firm, you know, in-house. Nice. And that was my first real job, like corporate job. <laughs> that I, I, I actually uh, had a flat tire downtown where you guys used to hang out by the Bonaventure. Mm -hmm. And the guy I was riding with, I said, I remember coming down here uh, and just to see okay. you guys at lunch, it'll be 200 bike messengers and I thought it was the craziest thing. I was like, man, that's so cool. Like, and it was a melting pot of people. I mean, it wasn't just blacks. It wasn't just whites. I mean, it was everyone. Some of these guys, they looked like they were in their 50s, but they were doing something they loved, which was riding bikes and delivering documents. It seemed like life was so easy back then. It was. It was. It was simple. You, you did what you, you know, you had a pager, you had a backpack. Yeah. You, know, you were flying through downtown and it was like, yeah, you, you got paid to ride a bike. So, That's so yeah. cool. What inspired you to 
Uh, you talked about having your, your, your skate shop. I remember that. It was community-based. What inspired you to, like, go on this philanthropy mission? Uh, you founded LA Bike Academy. What was that pivotal moment? So entrepreneurship was, was independence for me. And even though I knew there wasn't going to be a lot of financial reward in the beginning or who knows when ever uh, <laughs> ever exactly <laughs> exactly that 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 inspired me but it was also community too because i grew up understanding that okay you can be a part of the problem or you can be a part of the solution and so uh the issue of diversity in the sport when that as you guys came up and became older juniors right for me it wasn't enough so it was like i need to do my part to add to that equation so even though you were having success and a handful of other dreams were having success, it was like, I want to do more. I need to do more. But it was also about seeing the proof that, yo, you're national champion. So you did it. It's like, okay, we need to keep this going in one way or another. And that's, that was, that was the, uh, that was the turning point. Yeah. Looking back on, on, on the times where we had, um, like I said, yourself, David Puglia, I, I'm not going to name out so many names, Alan Cox, the, the Scott family, uh, just the major motion as a whole. I always tell the story about how it was it was a lot of different personalities, but for the most part, it was one community. You know, um, you had Emin and Renee and so many different families that this cycling club, it was just a group of individuals that love riding bikes. And then once the juniors came on board, we immediately became their extended family. And I don't see that today, you know, amongst um, a lot of clubs. So I think it's important for like the your organization, LA Bike Academy and others to bring that back, you know, because I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for that. And you talk about Steven Salazar. He's now a, uh, fire, a firefighter in LA County and we can go on and on with the list of riders like uh, Kenny Burgess who now has a family graduated from Indiana University and, and lives in uh, Georgia you know it's just so many different uh, great stories that came out of the program of Major Motion because of people like yourself Dave and others that pretty much nourished us you know the community understood the importance of supporting young people and uh, I was talking to Dave about this about a week ago, is that as, as you came up and Steven and those juniors, it's like we looked at each other and we clearly knew who the talent was. Like we were racing, but then we realized, okay, these guys are the talent. And it was just, it was just important to us. It was, it was that community that you said, that you said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna pass the torch and support what's important to us. And like you said, every junior that I know of that was involved at that particular time, they're in a really, really good place now. And, they, and not necessarily in cycling, but in their career and raising families and whatnot. And it was the central piece of that was cycling. And yeah. so I'm, I'm so grateful to be able to like still be here, be involved and, and, and look at what you're doing, man. Cause like you blew up in my opinion, like well before because I was involved, but when you did the pro team, I was like, dude, that was like incredible. And so once again, it was just like that seed that was planted with obviously your family you know, and, and everybody else that was involved to show you that you could do what you did. And you did it. You know, we all did it. You know? Yeah, I actually I man, I really appreciate that. And, you know, as I get older, I, I get to reflect on those moments and that's why when i do a lot of speaking in front of people and say hey you know i want to start a foundation or you know how can i get involved with the community i'm like you don't have to have this big grand foundation to make an impact you know just think about it it for the most part it was a, a club that took four kids under their wing and look what happened you know what i mean so it wasn't like you guys had this mission to go out and find the next best cyclist and get that person to the Tour de France. It was like, no, they're in the hood. We're going to take care of them as, as, as if they are our own. Um, we're going to make sure they stay on the right path. And 
it was that uh, I think it was more of the example more than anything that changed our path of life not cycling um, not you know trying to be a bike racer it was the example that was set you know I, I could, again I could name names within the group uh, that were entrepreneurs and you see um, the lifestyle they live you see how healthy they are you see the relationships they have I mean it was just so many positive things that we were exposed to so um, for the listeners out there I think if you have ambitions to uh, do something like the LA Bicycle Academy I think this is a perfect example of that it doesn't take a million dollars you know uh, it, it could be very minimal it may take a lot of sweat equity which is up to a million dollars if not more uh, but you don't need a, a gigantic uh, bank account so I uh, was scheming through the website and um, you have something you, you you clearly understand how liberating and educational uh, education in cycling uh, you know can be great for young people and you have a blurb on there that says the LA Bicycle Academy is described as a youth cycling team and bicycle education program with a mission to empower, educate, and develop entrepreneurial and leadership skills in youth between 8 and 18. And your focus is to develop uh, the youth in underserved communities where opportunity, access, equity, and exposure uh, within the sport of cycling is extremely limited. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that and what type of uh, I guess what type of uh, things you offer oh, to the kids that uh, that you're working with? Right. So our current cycling team, uh, one of the prerequisites for them to be on the team is to be involved with uh, uh, bicycle mechanic classes that are uh, led by uh, Aaron Swanton, our program manager, which will obviously as we grow into a building will be our program manager. So what they're required to do is show up, you know, once a week and work on their own bikes. And so this is the goal there is for them to become self-sufficient and obviously learn the basic skills around bicycle mechanics. So that's that's sort of like a our beginning uh, part of an earn a bike program. And as we grow, uh, we understand that those skills that sets will translate into other opportunities. So in a retail environment we'll continue that where young people earn a bike and then as we grow we will show them other aspects of bicycle retail so whatever you see in a bike shop we'll kind of show them how that works in the relationship between the business the wholesale in sales inventory you name it and then sort of build the relationship with those vendors to show them that yeah, you may, you may be in bike retail now, but if you go to college or you develop uh, certain skill sets, whether you say photography, graphic design, you name it, all those opportunities are available in the bike industry and beyond. So it's not just specific to the bike industry. It's just that that's the beginning point. So mm -hmm. our program is, is, to tra is to develop those skills and provide those skills to them and that could translate into, into career and opportunities. And I think you are 100% spot on because, uh, like you know, it's not just bike racing where you can make a living. In fact, people within the corporate office walls probably make more than professional bike racers, uh, you know, financially. It's a, it's a longer career, um, and I think you can have just as much fun, you know. Um, you know I, I'm fortunate enough to work for a company where we do a lot of incredible things. We're working in the community. Um, we, you know, we get the luxury of, of travel and, and being around like-minded people. So, yeah, I think that that initiative to showing them uh, other layers of the industry is important. And, you know, just like bike racing, there's not a lot of diversity in those corporate walls, you know. So I think um, it's a it's a long burn for what you're doing, but eventually it will pay off. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, that's a. Uh, that's awesome. I think the other important piece too is is what what we're doing, what you are doing, what I'm doing is that it, it's provided us an opportunity to, to have agency over what we're doing, man. Like I look at the Bahati Foundation as like this, I like to say this black thing that's <laughs> like just it it's it's dominant, bro. It's like you're like you're massive in terms of like your reach and who you are and what you've done. So it's like, yeah, you have this career that you 
in, in terms of professional cycling, but it, it goes beyond that in terms of your involvement in the community and how people relate to what you're doing, you mm -hmm. know? And so, and you, and once again, it goes back to agency. So your image, your likeness, your narrative is, is the, it, you see it, you know, and that's, that's the important piece too, because I mean, obviously if it was somebody else's, it would be a completely different message or they would say, well, say it like this, not like that. And like, sure. we understand it, it's equity, bro. It's like, we, we have to develop the equity to be able to take that next step, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of, okay, where's the next Justin going to come from or the next court. And you said something in, um, Sacramento. I remember it vividly at, we were at the bar and you said, at this particular, and you've said it actually more than one time. It was, I think it was either shortly after that. You said that if now in this time, we don't develop those next riders, it won't be nobody else's fault. I think something to that. Do you remember that? Yeah, I was basically saying like, now is the time. We have the world's attention. <clears throat> we have the support of the industry, you know, uh, endemic and non-endemic uh, support. And it's like, if if uh, Legion of Los Angeles goes away in the next ten years, or even if they don't go away in the next ten years, we hope they're around, right? Um, but if there's not another uh, Justin Williams within the next ten years, or even multiple Justin Williams, you have to look at it in the mirror and say, "What am I doing wrong?" Because the whole idea is to inspire the next generation right so you're talking about a decade there's got to be some kids out there right now it's like i'm going to start a team in the next few years i'm gonna do what i have to do i may go to college and get a business degree or not but i'm paying attention to what's going on and i'm gonna start a team or i'm gonna start a league or i'm gonna start a foundation or whatever it may be to continue to change the narrative within our community and i told you I, I told justin this face to face and i think it's important not only for him for me, for you, for everyone who's doing this this sort of work, because if we don't bring more people to the party, we can't do this forever. You know what I mean? And and so it's it's important that we continue to uplift uh, the, the the ones that's going to come after us, because they're the ones that's going to keep that legacy going and change the narrative within our community. And and that's basically what I was saying in a nutshell. That, that has to happen, Rasan. It's like, I don't know, like I'm 60, bro. And like, here's here's one of the philosophies that I've taken. Man, on. you don't look at day over 40, man. Thank you, sir. Bicycle ride, a lot of, lot of water, I guess. <laughs> but um, all the, so the young people that are involved with LA Bike Academy, anything that I ask them to do, and these are simple things, like, like Zach does some of the website content, and this is real, easy stuff right or somebody may do some posts on instagram well guess what i compensate them for that and and i tell them the reason i'm and not not a ton of money but you know zach does some website updates i'll pay him 50 bucks whatever but here's my point i'm trying to empower them and make them understand that guess what what if you were a web developer look up how much web developers make look out how, how much a content creator makes like I'm trying to like nudge these guys about our YouTube thing that if you want to be in charge of this, you could, this, this could be the empowerment piece. And so my mm -hmm. point is we, we got to figure out how to way to pass that baton and yeah. find those riders, man. They're out there. And, and I mean, Justin and them are making it attractive, but the talent pool has to increase. That's the first step, you know? And it might be from a very grassroots level, but finding more kids, whatever, to get on bicycles, which we're doing, right? But I think that next step might have to involve some kind of competitive talent pool, like they're doing in South Africa or in Africa across the board. They're using Zwift as a starting point to uh, accrue data. Now, granted, these these all these kids are not on the road and they haven't learned all the skill sets but the but the numbers show that they're doing numbers up out duez and climbs like that that replicate elite athletes in you so that's the starting point and they're doing it on a massive scale and that's just indoors 
with Zwift. And so we, we in the United States, we need to somehow try to replicate it, you know? And it might, it might require a collective effort, you know, because we're all like, we're doing, we're doing, you know, it's cycling, but we're kind of doing, we're on different paths, but there's a way to connect that, you know, at some point in the name of like, like you said, that next, that next, uh, you know, Justin and Corey. Yeah, you know, I've always said when we get to the point where the, the, the leaders in the industry can drop their egos aside and work together, we'll be better. Um, you know, two of the leading bike brands uh, don't like saying each other's names in, in board meetings. You know, they have acronyms for it and stuff like that. And a lot of it is just the competitive nature. Uh, but the reality is they don't typically work together. So just imagine you take the, the five top massive brands within the industry. We just specifically talking about the bicycle and they all came together financially, you know, and then with all the other resources they have and think about the impact we could have um, across the United States and all the urban inner city areas that, you know, we could have an impact on. And it's funny because um, it's, right you're right, the talent pool needs needs to grow. Uh, I, I, I poke at Justin for not having enough black people on his team. But the reality is when you go out there to look for black talent that's ready to race at that level, they're not there. You know what I'm saying? So you, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place because, okay, there are some black racers out there. Do you just put them on the team because they're black? Or, you know, or do you say, you know what, I got to do what I got to do and I'll just try to get the coolest person that, that's going to fit our mold of the program no matter what they look like, which is absolutely fine. But if the mission is still to change the the not change the color of the sport, but add our color to the sport, you got to have color in the sport. And so um, I've, I've actually dealt with the same the same scenario. Even today, I'm still trying to find young, you know, black and brown kids, male, female to to join our program. And again, they're out there. But. It's like you need that one person to champion those young people because it's going to be more time and effort than it is money. And at this point in my life, I don't have that time as I'm raising my own family. You know what I'm saying? So it's 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 a it's a tough it's a tough one to crack right now. And so it goes back to my point with the industry leaders. They all came together. We can do this. I agree. I agree. That that concept is. So you know uh, FC FC is it FC Barcelona the the yep. the, the large yeah so uh, BC uh, BC right so that organization I believe is is the net worth it's a it's a nonprofit membership organization I think it's worth like eight billion dollars mm -hmm. but my point of the the, the 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 wealth value is that 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 organization has soccer and academic academies from the age of five all the way up and i'm talking about it's you, you can look it up it's professional so they have each age group that they they get full scholarships that they teach these kids the game of football and they're educating them why are they doing that because they're trying to find that next star and by the way i think a nine pro tour teams and you probably know this uh support and finance from u23 all the way down to cadet meaning little children in cycle because they understand that next level or that that six, seven year old will be a pro in so many years. So they're investing in the sport, at least over there. I think to your point, we we, we should somehow, you know, and maybe, and maybe it'll take time to bring those people together to support this idea that we just need to increase the talent pool. And yeah, it's gonna take five years, but there's no other way around it. And of course, it's, it's the resources that we need, not necessarily the physical body, you know, we, sure. we, we need the resources to do it, so. Do you think uh, USA Cycling has a part to play in this? Absolutely, yeah. What, what do you think they can do differently? Could you talk about like these organizations in, in other countries, and I've even seen it with the, 
Australian Cycling Institute when I was growing up as a junior. Like, man, why are all these Australian juniors so good? I mean, you look at the cloth, they, the fabric they came from is like they started at this young age. They had this institution, and it was it was cycling school, cycling school, cycling school, and then they produced some of the best cycling in the world, cyclists in the world. And I think it's kind of, they still have really good cyclists, but then now that kind of had tra transitioned to Colombia. And now Colombia kind of adopted what they were doing, and it took ten years. But now look at the fruits of their labor. What do you think? What do you think USAC can do differently? So, first and foremost, they they need to redefine their talent ID camp. Period. That that's the start. Mm -hmm. Because if if you're saying that we're trying to find the best ten or whatever to go race in Europe, to do blocks of racing, like hey, dive in. Get get your head kicked in. Get better. Come back. Get better. You that's where you start. If, if, you're, if you're charging ten thousand dollars for a kid to come and for you to evaluate, you're already limiting the talent. Yeah, you're limiting the talent. Like mm -hmm. okay, you could maybe have that, but you also need to have maybe a basic FTP platform mm -hmm. and put another hundred juniors just on that to accrue the numbers, mm -hmm. right? Because numbers don't lie to some extent. I mean, yeah, it has nothing to do with bike handling skills and all that other stuff, but it still is a basis for like, okay, come back. Like we go continue to work with you, et cetera. And so they, that, that, they have an opportunity to increase their talent pool by, by just saying this, the, we're gonna expand the talent ID camp to just any kid in America mm -hmm. or just expand it, you know, and they definitely have a role in that. Yeah, I agree that the whole FTP thing and uh, charging to go to a camp is, he, I would say you knock out 80% of the kids that could potentially show the kids who could afford to go right out of the camp. Um, and, and the reality is, and even at a pro level, I don't know the, the exact numbers, but I would guess that it's it's a small percentage of the pros that have that bike handling skills that you know uh someone like justin has within the pro peloton i mean at the highest level they have the biggest ftps and can go up hills and do, can do all that stuff and blow everybody out of water but it's a small percentage of of that group that could act that actually has like legit bike handling skills and those are the ones that's doing the crazy stuff you know in the finish and that's a very small percentage so going off someone's ftp um and their weight and their physiological uh physiological makeup is is a huge metric you know that you could actually find some talent um let's let's get back into the bike academy la bike academy um what are some of your so we're in a we're in a new year uh, you know, we have 12 months to make some positive things happen. What are some of your top goals for this year? So, um, our race season starts in a couple of weeks and obviously we have, uh, 13 riders, young riders that we're going to support. Uh, we're also going to be doing, uh, uh, community bike shop at the local farmer's market. So our earn a bike program is, uh, essentially in the beginning with well, early spring, is going to be a pop-up version of our earn a bike program and we're we're going to be stationed at some of the uh, local uh, <clears throat> farmers markets around the community mm -hmm. and so through that the goal is to eventually get into a physical building you know and we're actually actively working on that uh as i speak now and so so the summer will be filled with the earn a bike program at the farmers market uh community bike rides uh, uh, we're going to be actually promoting a bike ride from the Crenshaw Farmers Market that will uh, allow just community people to do a bike ride. So the idea is for for us to simply shop around a group of, say, adults with their children to do a loop through the community mm -hmm. and to sort of like bring to light how they could ride from their house, which might be three or four blocks away, to the Farmers Market or any other place mm -hmm. in the community. So. It's like just the beginning stages of showing people that they could, they there is bike access, if if they had people guiding them to do that to do that and show them how to do it. So community bike rides, farmers market, the earn a bike, uh, the earn a bike pop up program uh, at the farmers market. 
Yeah, you know, we, we live in the same area and we're seeing the transformation of this area, um, the uh, gentrification, if you will. And, you know, right now we really don't have a bike infrastructure. Um, you know, uh, my family likes to ride along the bike path and stuff like that. And it's only three miles from my house, but I would never, I think I've done it once. For the most part, we pack our car with the bikes we drive three miles then we get out just because you know the infrastructure is not there um, there is no protected bike lanes so i think the more we have these organized rides like you're mentioning and that you're going to do uh out there it'll prompt the community to pay attention you know and, and also we need to educate the the civilians the drivers because a lot of times i don't think they want to kill us they just uneducated you know, uh, when I ride, sometimes I'm coming home doing my last efforts. I'm going 28, 30 miles an hour. They don't comprehend that I'm coming at them that fast. They think, you know, maybe, <laughs> oh, he'll be here in, in 10 seconds. Or in fact, I'll be there in three seconds, you know. So there's a lot of education uh, components, too. Have you ever thought about um, just bringing in uh, people off of the bike and, and you know, kind of educating them on, how to treat a cyclist and you know we do have a law what is it six feet three feet what is the law six it's a six foot law that's on the no board. one no one obeys that law yeah you know? no one obeys that law I, was, <laughs> I hit the other day no but you're right i think that, that is definitely a goal of ours because you know in in la county there are uh, organizations that have a lot more experience around bicycle advocacy and the education that's connected to that and to your point, like if you think about where we live, adjacent to that is that bike lane. So why shouldn't there be a bike lane or a dedicated bike lane? I'm talking about connecting, let's say King Boulevard, as far east as Central Avenue. Why? Because it's it's the it's the eastern end of the city to the western west end of the city. So if you connect that as a bike path all the way to the Bologna Creek. Then, then people would use it. They would feel safer to use it. So yeah. the, the, the goal would be to connect with like uh, LA Bike Coalition and so, several other organizations that do that type of work and say, okay, we know you're central to maybe the West Side or whatever, but let's, let's create a campaign or a focus group to advocate for a bike lane specifically in the Crenshaw and Merck Park District, mm -hmm. right? And if the goal is a year or two from now, because the resources are there and the, and, and the reasoning why it, it just needs to happen because that's the connection between where we are and the beach area or the west side of town so so add that bike lane you know from from on king on uh, was the obama that merges from king boulevard mm -hmm. all the way to cobra city you know because yeah. that stretch it's like a freeway almost <laughs> it like is. When you're on obama it, it doing yeah. 60 70 miles an hour man yeah. in a hurry. and that's the way i get out of town that's the way i have to go you know and yeah it's 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 frustrating uh, it doesn't matter what time of the day you go sometimes i'm on the bike at 6 a.m they're racing you know coming back at 3 p.m they're racing it just doesn't matter the street is so manicured and paved and wide open you can just go as fast as you want uh if you don't mind walking us through the steps on exactly how uh one of your participants earn a bike so from start to finish sure so there's a there's a application that will be provided for you know a child and their parent to fill out and a lot of our bikes come from donations so they're used bikes and that young person would come in, they would choose a bike of their liking, you know, different types of bikes. I have come and they would begin to, they yes. would accrue hours and they would start with, you know, uh, a section of the bike adjusting brakes or replacing brakes and they would go to gears and they would go to flat repair. So they would accrue these, uh, a, a specific amount of hours. And once upon completion, and that's concurrently working on the bike, Upon completion, mm -hmm. they would earn that bicycle along with a lock, a light, uh, a lock, lights, and a, a helmet. And so it's about accruing hours and learning every aspect of either refurbishing the bike or repairing the bicycle. And I would, I would say the, 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 the average number of hours from start to finish is four to six weeks. So, they, so okay. it's a four to six week program 
uh, programming that will that they'll be involved with to earn that bicep. And then that's where all the other exposure comes into play, where now they're in a setting and they see all these other things as it relates to bicycle retail. You know, you might drop in like, hey, yo, this is Rasan Bahadi, 11 time, whatever, national champion. They're looking like, what? You know, so there's all that, that they, you know, have an opportunity to be involved with, you know. I might, I may need to take the class because I'm not a bike mechanic. I know, man. I'm like, (laughs) there, maybe I might be able to break a chain. Do you have any ambitions to expand uh, the women's side of your sport? I mean, of your team? We do. We do. We're going to actually support. Um, we have three women that we're going to support in 20, this year on the team. You know? And uh, that was that was our, our goal. You know, we had, you know, never really supported women. And obviously, mm-hmm. you know, it's a huge part of the sport. So, yeah, we have we have three young women uh, that are. Two are cat four and one is a cat three. And so, yeah, we're going to support three women this year. Yeah, it's been exciting seeing the women's side of the sport grow. Uh, one of the team's good sponsors, the Canyon Scram, and they just released their new kit, which is uh, pretty in your face. And I think it's it's time that, like, they can express themselves the way they would like versus what the – directors or coaches or sponsors used to want them to look like you know now they just have a big splatter of color and it's it's very you know i think it's a pretty cool kit uh, i like it a yeah, lot i think i briefly saw it yeah it's pretty it's pretty bright and different yeah yeah it's different yeah and i think it represents their team you know um so earlier you, you, off air you said uh, before we got going you had a story you wanted to throw out and to see if i remember i'm, I'm curious to know what that story is so you had US Pro. Uh Philly. Do you remember that story? Where no. you were so you call me from the hotel. Um so the story what I remember is that you were in the breakaway with probably a handful of laps to go. And you were called back from the break. Oh yeah. I remember that story. Because the designated sprinter was back there or whatever. And that guy finished seventh or eighth. And like, you're ready to quit. You're like, yeah. I'm done with this shit. Like, I'm done. Excuse me. Yeah. You were like, and I don't remember what I said, but it was like, you know, it, it was one of those things where you knew or you believe that if that wouldn't have been, and you did your job, you also did your job, you know, but, but you felt that if that wasn't the, 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 the command that you could have won that race, you know, Yeah. but, but that's cycling. And so it's also BS now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I remember that story. It, it wasn't quite a break, but I was in the lead group on the second time up uh, Manny Young which was a huge accomplishment for me. Um, my, my, whole, my whole cycling career had kind of changed at that point. It was 2006, um, and I was being coached by Alan Lamb, and he really got me to adapt to riding seven hours and racing like six and a half, seven hours. So doing, uh, doing Philly, it was a big deal, but I was prepared. And so, yeah, I got over, I got over the Maniunk wall with the lead group by a hair. But once you get over the downhills, you know, you're going 50 miles an hour. Um, and in the radio, I'm not going to call no names. Uh, he's back there. Wait for him. I'm like, wait for him. I'm in the lead group. Um, but, yeah, waited for him. Got him back to the group. Uh, I was pretty much spent after that because we have two more climbs to get to the finish. Strawberry Hill and then Lemon Hill. And then over Kelly, over through Kelly Drive, and yeah, I just uh, couldn't recover, and uh, that that was the end of it. So um, that was a tough pill to swallow. But like you said, I did my job, and I had to live with it. And then, of course, you know, I, I think back to to, to Philly. Uh, I think it was 2000 when you won the, the road in the crit, uh, the Junior National Road in crit, and mm-hmm. I remember like people, <laughs> not like like literally comments parents like oh he can't climb or he's not a cl-. like literally and yeah. so think about like i'm a i'm an older you know adult in philly i'm supporting you there's some younger riders there from our team and i'm like wow these people like really you know like 
what? And then you came through solo. Dude, I was screaming <laughs> to the top of my love. Do you remember? My, I, I, I bet you, I said, if you win both races, I'll give you $100 a piece. Yeah. And you won both races. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a, I actually have a picture of you uh, standing on a wall somewhere and me crossing the line. Please, yeah. I remember that. <laughs> Trying to yeah. want to be photographer or whatever. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was incredible, bro. Man, I think we could talk, you know, for hours just giving uh, our past. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap it up because we've, we've covered a lot. And I'm sure that we could probably do a part two um, because, the you know, the Black Celebration Series for Zwift is not just about February and, the, and, and Black History Month. Um, it's about all months. It's about all weeks, all days. And there's a story to be told. So I would like actually like to follow up with you. Um, some maybe sometime in the summer and see how the programs are going, how many bikes are, are being refurbished and getting out to kids and, and you know, just to check on your um your journey to find your brick and mortar uh for your for your bike academy. Um what what are ways the listeners can get involved to support um what you're doing? I I, I really like that you want to get the establishment going. How how can they help you uh find that or support that? So obviously, you know, people have the ability to donate. Uh, we're going to have a volunteer uh, sign up sheet real soon that'll be on the website. Because uh, what we want to do is expand uh, late spring, early summer, uh, our, our pop up earn a bike uh, at, at a few other farmers markets. So if you directly email me, obviously, you're interested in volunteering or donating. Uh, just go to labikeacademy.org uh, uh, and support the program. We're we're nonprofit. It's obviously tax deductible. Uh, and uh, oh, by the way, we did get that insurance. I think you, you <laughs> yeah, we yeah, knocked that out. But um, but yeah, just go to the website, donate, uh, reach out to us. We are accepting uh, used refurbished bicycles. And so that's sort of the start of getting other kids uh, involved in the earn a bike piece. So man, it was so nice to talk to you and, and catch up and, and spread the awareness of the Los Angeles Bicycle Academy, uh, which I see all the kids riding around town all the time. Uh, remember, there is a group ride on Zwift, February 19th at 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, um, part of the black celebration series so uh hop on make sure you go to companion app hit the events find the group and uh join damon and his team uh doing the black celebration series so damon thanks so much and uh hope to speak to you soon welcome man appreciate it thanks for the opportunity Well, I thoroughly enjoyed that. That is a nice way to cycle 10 miles. Whew. Well, it's not quite finished. Not quitting out until I get my outfit unlocked. Right, I've got to go get ready to sort some of my stuff out for mum and then I'll be back on at 7 o'clock because there's a ride with some of the Chapter 3 guys that are uh, probably going to kill me. But, uh, yeah, a bit going. Uh, thank you guys for joining me yet again. And I uh, might see you later. Well, I won't see you. That's not how the internet works, is it? But you might see me later. Uh, thanks again. And uh, catch you next time. If I can find my mouse pointer, I need to turn my mouse on. That might help. There we go.